I'm Mona, your host on Solutions, the lively show for people who had polio. Get ready to embark on a journey of empowerment and inspiration. We have episodes every first Wednesday of the month at 10 a.m. Eastern Canada time. Join us for the dynamic, informative talks about polio and your needs. What are your solutions? Join us. Hello everyone, I'm Mona and this is Solutions Live. Change can be hard for many people to accept, but it's worth remembering that part of growing as a person means accepting that life is always changing. We might change our jobs, have to relocate unexpectedly or have other major things happen to us, but these changes are just part of life. Even if change unsettles you, you can cope by managing your stress, developing a positive mindset and looking to the future. All we actually want for ourselves is to adapt and change safely into our own way lifestyle should be so we can enjoy the way we live. When our basic needs are being taken care of effortlessly, it will really help us to live better and more securely, thus achieving what we experience more and undertaking those things we really love to do. Caregiving can do this for us. To all who need caregivers, caregiving is a complicated need for all of us. And those of us who do not have a direct person in their life have different needs than those who have live-in partners. Today, I will look into partners who can give care to their lived-in loved ones. Next time, I will tackle the other difficult topic of getting care from an outside helper, paid or volunteer. We are all looking for love. Love changes and grows and morphs and expands into the unknown worlds. What we were and where we are today has no relativity. We are still each other and all we ever knew back then is now. It is who we are. Our being is the same. We did and do what needs to be done in our own special way. A caregiver's greatest strength lies in their ability to put the needs of others before their own. Caregiving is not about what you do, but about who you are and the love you bring to others. A caregiver or nurturer is someone who provides direct, compassionate care, often to a loved one or friend. Those over 75 years old typically care for a spouse or partner, dedicating an average of 24.4 year hours per week, with 23% of spouses, caregivers exceeding 41 hours. Caregiving can range from emotional support to living with the person receiving the care, primarily occurring in the home, fostering a nurturing and empathetic environment. Slide number one, Ken. This is a caregiver. Do caregivers get angry? Yes, of course, but they don't often talk about the anger, impatience, and even rage that can flare in an instant. If you have ever felt like clenching your fists and screaming in frustration, you're not alone. Most caregivers probably experience these strong emotions from time to time. Caregiving involves a wide range of duties including managing home and health care, advocating for medical needs, overseeing medications, assisting with personal hygiene, preparing nutritious meals, helping with mobility, performing home maintenance, providing transportation, offering companionships, handling financial tasks, and monitoring overall well-being. Kim, back to Mona. Of course, we must anticipate future changes in your primary caregiver. It's important to plan ahead. 
By preparing in advance, you can ensure continuity of care and minimize disruptions for your loved one. Look into these ideas. Creating a care plan, identifying backup caregivers, documenting care needs, exploring professional options. Caregiving through challenging, though challenging, offers profound rewards. It fosters a deep bond with the loved ones. Enriching relationships and allowing for meaningful conversations about their past and future. Caregiving also provides valuable life insights, highlighting the importance of planning for one's own future care. Additionally, it imparts lessons in practice and wisdom, emphasizing what truly matters in life. Despite its difficulties, caregiving is a deeply rewarding experience. The benefits and rewards of caregiving while keeping an older loved one happy and healthy is hard work. There are some perks that shouldn't be ignored. For those who are lucky enough to spend those precious years in a caregiving role, the bond that forms can be the closest of a lifetime. As your older loved one becomes more vulnerable and depends on you for putting for making more of their basic needs, the opportunity to talk and get to know these increases. As well, stories of their youth takes their dreams and wishes for their future are more abundant, even amid fears and concerns of aging. The trusted position of caregiver also brings about unique insight into life itself. Only after caring for your loved one can you truly appreciate how important it is to set up support systems for your golden years. These values can lead the way for conversations with your spouse and children about how you wish to be cared for in your later decades. And now I would like to introduce a few of my polio couple friends, fortunate enough to be able to help their loved ones. <clears throat> Ken, Roland, and June, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Roland has polio and June is deaf. They work out life together, signing and looking at each other. Roland's polio is in his upper body and he has many unique ways to compensate for his difficulties such as how he eats at the table. Roly tells us all about this. Would you describe how you sign to June, who is deaf, Roly, with your weak hands? Okay, so uh, I can't. Oh, I put the camera down a bit. Yeah. Thank you. So, no, so mainly I use one hand no. because the other one, after a few seconds, it just falls off. So uh, June understands me after like, what is it, 45 years now? Communication, about 45 years. So I think sometime before I say something, she read my mind. So, uh, but uh, in, in order to talk to each other, is I will use one hand to communicate. Okay, we'll put, Ken, would you put some of the pictures of Roly on, on the screen? And Roly, keep talking. Okay, well, this is typical if, uh, this is uh, where we're having soup that day. And uh, if you notice, my chair is a lawn chair, uh, which sits lower when I sit at the table because uh, if I use a regular chair, by the time the spoon comes up to my mouth, uh, it's empty because it's back in the plate. So I have to crunch over in order to eat and eat properly and uh, have to be careful because when you crunch like that and you eat, the digestion is not that great. So a uh, uh, little bit then stand up for a second and go for the second one. So, and uh, everything is prepared by my wife and uh, 
she's basically a caregiver for 24 hours a day of uh, what I need. Of, uh, I don't, uh, how would I say? Next I didn't need that. I'm sorry, what? Next picture. Ken? Okay, this is uh, Mona's husband, by the way. Um, a ramp for uh, my wheelchair. Uh, we have two doors. The front is going through three doors to the lobby, but that access me right to the back door. So a uh, uh, little ramp you just unfold it, and guess who unfolds it? My wife. Uh, who brings the chairs in? My wife, uh, who takes care of everything for my power chair, is my wife, and she got her own scooter that she brings in, and uh, she takes. I I can do it. I can do everything. The only part is, let's say for a shower, for instance, I, I can shower myself. I had a little niche there put there so I could put my elbow, wash my. The only difference is if my wife comes with me in the shower, it is a 10 minute deal. If I do it by myself, it is a 45 minute deal. And when I get out of there, I want to go to bed because I'm exhausted. No matter what I do, when I finish, I'm exhausted. So if we want to enjoy the day, my wife steps in, she says, okay, let's go. We're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this. And even sometimes when we'll go out, and she said, okay, I got to go to the bank. I have to go here. I got, okay, good. And after the second obstacle, I drive me home. I've had enough. So, you know, it's like, but if she wasn't there, I wouldn't do it at all. Because I know is what it takes out of you. So, and uh, the only one I really, really like is to go out. Because we have like about 80 miles of trails around here. And we're not going nowhere. We just scout where we're going to go tomorrow. And if the weather permits and if I'm healthy enough, we will go. And uh, we're gone for five, six hours. We come home. Ken, back to, Ken, back, to uh, back to our couple. Yes, sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, that's okay. So when we go out, then we come back for lunch or supper, and uh, uh, we enjoy it. But everything else in the house is my wife does it, my wife does it. And that's why I became also a gadget person to take some of the burden off my wife. Little things like my bed is automatic. My, even the blind in our house is automatic. So there's things I could do. Hey, I'm going to buy, put the blinds down, put the blinds up. Uh, but, you know, and if she goes to bed, I can still function. I have a station. That's my height for my coffee machine. Uh, everything is made for me that I need. So, and if something else, then I have to wait till next morning. And she keeps saying, like, if you need something, wake me up. No, that's okay. I will not do that. I won't wake her up. But my limitation, and like I said, I could do anything I want to do. But how long can I do it? That's the problem. And I don't want to spoil her day by saying, okay, let me do this, I do that, I do that. And then when it comes to go, I go, no, nah, today is not going to be the day. You know, that spoils her day. So she works around me all the time, around me all the time. So I always tell her, keep some plan for yourself. So in case I die, cancel or something like that, that you have something to do. So, which turns out to be very, very good. But luckily, luckily, luckily enough, uh, it's a shared thing. Uh, when I first met my wife, uh, she would not talk. She would not involved with people she would just sit there and watch and i took over and i said come on now here's what you're gonna do and i went to i was mean i got her to the legion i bought her a drink bought her a second drink 
bother a third drink. And I said, okay, this is this, 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 this person. And I'm leaving, going in the office. I got some work to do. And that forced her to communicate with people. And when I went home, I said, so how was it? She said, oh, I was kind of boring. I said, why? She says, well, people don't talk to me. Well, if people don't talk to you, is it because you didn't talk to them? But she says, well, I'm scared to make a mistake. Do you think they're scared that you're not going to understand what they're going to say? They go both ways. The next time, everything was wide open. Her business, the same thing. She would always say, hey, somebody goes to a front counter or a customer. It's your customer. You go. Take care of your customer. So therefore, now she's paying me back a hundred times more that I gave her. And I'm so lucky, lucky, very, very, very lucky to have a good wife like that. So it, it gets a little emotion sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but work hard and Life throws you curves, sometimes bad curves, and uh, uh, we just take it on and move on. And we were lucky. Our kids never had problem, but grandchildren, everything, knock on wood, everything is beautiful. And uh, our life is everything, everything, everything is where it's supposed to be because of her because of her. I wouldn't even be on chat or anything, or Zoom, anything like that if I wasn't for my wife. Because she said, go, go, go. She says, I like when you go, you come out of there, you're fresh or you're mad, but you have something before you had nothing. So anyway, that's my saying on things like that. So thank you very much for your time and have yourself a nice day. Thank you, Roly. Thank you very much, June. It's been wonderful. Ken, can you just show the rest of the pictures of Roly and his wife before we go on to our next guest? This is the ramp being opened. This is um, June showing me how to use Roly's wheelchair. <laughs> next. And this is us in Ottawa. Gatineau visiting with Roly and June. What a wonderful experience to be able to meet other polio couples. Thank you both very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And now Ken, off screen, um, can you can you put the next set of pictures up? That's for Diane and Dennis. We'll start with the pictures. That's Diane and Ken, the early years. Diane and Dennis. Diane and Dennis. And this is Diane and Dennis now. Okay, Diane and Dennis, please enter the screen. Hi. Hi. Okay. Yes. I would just like to, to introduce Diane and Dennis Wall. They have been married for 46 years. Diane was born with polio because her mother contracted polio in her ninth month of pregnancy. When Diane and Dennis were first married, it was evident that Diane had a disability, but she was very capable of being truly independent. As the years have gone on, post-polio syndrome has taken many of her abilities away. Dennis stepped up as her caregiver, or as he likes to say, her supporter. They will now tell their story about how they define their rules and roles in their caregiving abilities. Take it away. All right, hi, I'm Diane. And as Mona said, we've been married a long time. And so we talked about it because before we were married, because it was evident I was disabled, but I never uh, walked with a cane or a walker. I never had braces. Um, I just had a prominent limp and I cocked my head a little bit, especially if I was really tired. So it was pretty evident, but I was very capable and I had adapted as all polioers are 
warriors at that. And um, I was, uh, I could drive, I could walk, I could hold a job. So um, it, it makes a difference, I think, for us going into our marriage, recognizing that I had this disability instead of trying to deny that it existed. It just wasn't at the forefront of our minds. Trying to be normal, of course I, I did. I tried to be as normal as possible, but I never denied that I had a disability. Even when I was very independent, I knew very well I could not do some things. Now, would I ask for help? No, but you know, that's another thing. I think the timing of my early diagnosis of PPS, post polio syndrome, I was only 35 and it helped us realize that there would really be some big changes up ahead. PPS was a brand new medical condition in the 1980s and I had to research it really to understand what might happen. We decided to adapt our house before we really kind of needed it, although I think we really did need it because the frequency of my falling was increasing. And putting in ramps, we lifted a sunken living room floor. Um, we did all kinds of things to adapt so that I wouldn't have to step up and step down so much. It was, I was ramped. Um, I think the denial part of me thinking that I could just handle anything was a coping mechanism that uh, down deep inside, I think I still use um, because it's been a lifetime. My stubbornness in not asking for help is probably one of the biggest roadblocks that Dennis has to put up with. Yeah. I think any caregiving um, is like that. I explained in my book that I tended to be, and I still am, a type A++ personality, always trying to control my environment. But once I lost certain abilities, such as using my arms, even though they were always weak, um, losing them and my arm adaptions, I always adapted. So even though my arms couldn't do, I just did anyway. Um, so I think I accepted Dennis's help a whole lot more when I started losing a whole lot more. It was a lot easier to say, I can't do this or I need help. And Dennis has always been there. He's always, you know, whenever I fall, he was always the one that picked me up. Now I don't want him to pick me up because it'll hurt his back. But um, I think caregivers have to cope with our anger and sometimes that anger is directed right at them and they don't deserve it. But we have a frustration and anger level that's high because we get very frustrated not knowing what's coming. Communication, that's the key yeah. to accepting caregiving from your spouse. For years, I was the one that took care of all the car repairs, the house repairs, you name it. I was in charge and I didn't need a lot of help, I directed not now. And Dennis does everything, the dishes, the grocery shopping, putting things away, you name it. He does it because just like Roly said, it, it takes such a high price for me. I can still do these things, but at what cost? So I measure that risk. Um, even when I worked for Dennis in his office, I, I still felt like I, I could do. I could do, but he was always there and I knew it. So um, all these things that I prided myself in and being able to do, I think pride is a factor in preventing the caregiver to do what they know we really need, probably better than we do sometimes. And um, that's the key to caregiving for me. I'm Dennis. Um, if you remember the before and after photographs that began our presentation, um, I'm the good looking guy. <laughs> um, I think of myself as my post-polio survivor supporter. Uh, many people call me a caregiver and that's okay. Um, but if I use the word supporter, you know what I mean. 
Flexibility, resilience, and innovation are keys, or to accommodate, to adjust, and to allow yourself to be utilized with kindness. Plans can change without warning. They have to. When plans need to change, it's not a choice, but a necessity. I had to learn this, and I'm still learning. Flexibility, resilience, and innovation. And with this quote, what I'm about to say, changing one cuss word from Alice Wong, a disability advocate and a survivor of muscular dystrophy, we are creative and innovative as heck because this world was never built for us. I am married. My postpolar survivor, as I will call her throughout this presentation, is my wife. This is beautiful Diane. She is the beautiful woman in the before and after photographs, just to, with the, that I'm standing next to. Uh, you may be familiar with her memoir, Somebody Told Me I Could, a polio survivor who's in it for the long haul. And you may already be familiar with me, as I am mentioned in it. Let me share a little from the perspective of a post-polio su supporter, caregiver, who's in it for the long haul too. The biggest thing I have learned is to be flexible, to adapt. And that is for a couple of reasons. First, that's what she does. Second, as Raleigh said, it's what's required or I couldn't be here. I wouldn't be talking to you or anything else. And finally, to want to work for the best supporting actor award. I think it's one of the key ingredients of being a caregiver. Um, as Red Green, a great Canadian, and one of my heroes said, remember, we're I'm all pulling for you. We're all in this in together. This together. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. <laughs> if the quality is someone is asked to look for or flexibility, innovation, or resilience, you'll find them in a post-polar survivor for sure and in the supporters. It works both ways. And I want to end with one example. We went earlier this year to Diane and I to the University of Florida to the um, physical therapists school where we, she spoke, she interacted with a number of physical therapist doctoral students. And she spent a great deal of time with them, and that was great. And while we were there, um, it was up in Gainesville, which is about two and a half hours away from us. And we were there. I did all the lifting and stuff. That was my part as the caregiver going in. Well, while she was giving the presentation or interacting with the students, um, during that time, I had an attack. You see, I have had radiation treatments for... Uh, prostate cancer, and I have radiation proctitis, radiation cystitis. <clears throat> While we were there, I had an attack, as I say. Um, uh, number two, uh, actually, so that you don't say it was the heart or something like that. It was, it was the other end, actually. Um, but uh, the biggest thing is that the flexibility, the resilience, the innovation, it works both ways. And it's nice to be kind. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. That was really an exciting talk and nice to meet the two of you. Thank you. And let's show the picture, the next picture of Mike and Mike. This is Mike. And now Mike never knew about his having polio until he was in his late 50s when he suddenly needed braces to walk. Yes, suddenly. Well, how does a wife cope with these extreme changes? Let's hear your story, Barbara and Mike. Let's put on the couple. Are we on? Yes, you're on. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, it is morning. No, I... Never knew I had polio until I had post-polio syndrome, uh, which is a long time. I figured out over the years that I had polio in probably 1948. That's as much as I had non-paralytic polio. Uh, interestingly enough, through life, I became a polio researcher, and I knew all about what was going to happen before I even knew it was going to happen to me. So it didn't come on as a great surprise when I found out I had polio and then I started having post-polio syndrome. 
I think the most difficult part of it was for Barbara because she saw me as an extremely active athletic person and we ran summer camps for children. I was always on the tennis court playing ball and all of a sudden I couldn't do much of that anymore. Uh, it came on very, very quickly for me. It came post polio syndrome affected my left ankle and then my left leg and then my right ankle and my right leg. And like you say, after in, in very few years, I wound up with two leg braces. Uh, I still feel that I can do everything I want to do. And unfortunately, I can't do much of that. She restricts me to one step on the ladder. And uh, <laughs> that cannot be alone in the house if you are going to go to the second step. That's and, a rule for both of us. Uh, I, I, post polio syndrome is expensive, folks, because you used to be able to do everything around the house, and now you have to call people in to do it for you. And at, at our age, interestingly, we, we, we rely on, on each other for a lot of things now. Uh, not, it, she's always watching me. It's like a hawk. You can't do this. You can't do that. Where is this? Where is that? You want me to drive? I can drive. And I, can, I don't do well driving at night. I can still drive, but I don't do well driving at night. And I, like I said, I mean, normally she won't. She's afraid to leave me alone. And I, and I know that, even though she won't admit it, because she would never leave me here for a couple of days and go back to the city. We're in our country house, which, uh, which is uncanny that right in front of our country house is a lake. And that's the lake that I got polio in. And still swimming in the lake. Uh, and found somebody else up here that got polio in the same lake at the same time I did. <clears throat> really, uh, well... I'm very good with this. Somehow, I always learned that you can't get upset over something you have no control over. And I tried to instill that in the kids and in everybody else. That's been my thing. And I just, no matter how bad this got, I just went with the flow. And I had to get her and the children and everything else to still go with the flow and understand what's happening and why it's happening. Uh, I remember once the boy said to me, well, we, we have an orthopedist that was a very good friend of ours and said, why can't he fix you? Because they thought he could fix everybody. And I had to explain to them that there's nothing to fix. Uh, I, I use the analogy that if you have want to make toast and you plug the toaster into the wall and the toaster doesn't work and you take it out and put it in another plug, another socket and toaster works. I said, see, it's it's not the toaster, it's the electricity coming from the wall into the toaster. Our friend can't fix me because I have no more electricity coming from the socket <laughs> into the muscle. And that just can't be fixed. Uh, I think a couple of times what they said was, and one of the women said it in a polio support group, and she said, how much worse is this going to get? I think for the caregivers, that's probably one of the biggest problems that they don't want to ask. And none of us can know how much worse it's going to get. We just don't know. But no matter how worse it gets, you just have to go with the flow. You're going to be miserable. That's all. And I, it was always harder on my wife than me with post Yes, Barbara. Yes, Barbara. <laughs> how, how hard has it been on you? Okay, first I'd like to use the word cope. The only thing I have to cope with is Michael smoking cigars. So let's make that very clear, okay? I like the word change. I like the word that we have to have a different sense of reality. But I will tell you this, Michael is more protective over me. He is protecting me to the nth degree of what he is living with. So when he says, it's a post-polio syndrome day, I understand. But when he said, it's not a walking day, I said, you're still walking. You're still walking. <laughs> he is like the Duracell bunny. He keeps going. And yes, I am the nudge who says to him, sit down for a little bit, sit down. Remember, as Dennis just said, he had a different medical condition. So did Michael. He had his 
triple bypass a year and a half ago. I think that is what makes me more conscious of being the caregiver because he just doesn't stop. He keeps going, which is wonderful. But we're very sensitive. We, I feel we reroute our thoughts. If we want to go out for dinner, we have to make sure the bathroom is on the main floor. One of our favorite restaurants has the bathroom all the way downstairs. That is a no-no. Yet he still says he loves the restaurant so much he would deal with it. But we are conscious of that. We're conscious of places we go that is it easy to maneuver? Is there a lot of walking? All those little things. And you know what? He had to be my caregiver not that long ago because I had a fractured pelvic area and I could not walk. I was in horrible pain. He cooked, he cleaned, he did everything. He wouldn't let me do anything. I'm thankful for that, that he's able. Mona, we came out of the doctor's office. She was on a walker and I was walking with crutches and everybody looked at two of us and I said, she's the patient. <laughs> But I, what I do want to say is that there is a reality in the family. We have two young, we have five grandchildren, three older ones, two little ones. They help grandpa when we're together, put his braces on. So they are seeing things that they're normally not used to. And he has, he tells them what to do. And I'm happy that they are growing up seeing that. The older grandchildren are sensitive to it and they are attentive, but the little ones help grandpa put his braces on and he instructs them. And that is important. And hopefully a little, we're going to be the last polio survivors my grandchildren will ever see. I hope so. But you know what? We manage, but again, I want to say, Michael is very protective over me. We do for each other what we can. If he can't take, say, his slacks off over his shoe or sneaker, it is easier for me to help him than to have to take the whole pants off. So we compliment each other. We're thankful that he could do what he could do. But I am the bigger nudge where I tell him, sit down for a while or stop. But he, he keeps going like the Duracell bunny and we call him Superman, but we're thankful for that, but he's always been protective of me. So it makes my chance to be a caregiver or his really his wife and support system because he is the way he is. And that I think is a key issue itself. Well, thank you very, very much, both Mike and Barbara. This has been very interesting and what a different couple, each of us. And now I would like to introduce my caregiver husband to you. And um, Ken, if you would like to show the pictures that I gave one by one, I will tell you this is, this is me in my favorite restaurant in my Cadillac, because I'm alone and I'm independent. Next picture. This is me in that same restaurant in my Rolls Royce. And that's a Rolls Royce because he's assisting me. And what a wonderful way to go and enjoy ourselves at our favorite restaurants. Next picture. This is my kitchen. When I'm in the kitchen, everything is out and open and easy for me to reach. Notice the bottom drawer is open. If Marcy was in there, it would absolutely be closed. <laughs> Next picture. This is my laundry room. <laughs> I'm able to take the clothes out of the washing machine just on the right side and put them into the dryer. But when it comes to hanging up those clothes, they just stay right on the door until Marcy comes by and helps me with it. This is me. Next picture. This is me traveling on one of the many um, pathways that we have here in Montreal. And as Roly says, Montreal and Quebec have the huge amounts of walkways for bicycles and wheelchairs to travel on. 
they might still have uh, lots of bumps in it, but we go along with it. Next picture. And my favorite person in the world was Judy Human. She will be called the, um, the mother of accessibility. She made a movie back in 19, um, no, 2020 about her camp. And this is her and her husband a, a few years ago. Judy on the left and George on the right, hanging on in his manual wheelchair. I'm not sure if they both had polio, but Judy for certain had polio all her life and was never able to walk at all. She's the one that made the movie. And now I would like to introduce oh. my husband, Marcy. Hey, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is the one who puts up with me all the time. <laughs> I had polio in my legs, but over the years, my upper body became weakened. Marcy started taking over the household needs about 20 years ago and now does all the cooking and cleanup or physical lifting. My son does the monthly house cleaning. Marcy helps with any emotional needs and he is my comic relief. Here you go, Marcy. Hi, it's nice to meet everybody, and it's nice that some of us has met, have met in person. So what does polio offer me? Polio offers me opportunity. That's what being a caregiver offers me, and in my way of thinking, it's a two-way street. We're fortunate. Mona, my wife, gives people the opportunity to know how to care for their polio life situations. How does she do this? By being the president of Polio Quebec, she offers her polio group, a solution show, like the one we're on now. And there are thousands of solutions, and she has lots of polio friends helping out all over the world. <clears throat> helping people find answers to their polio problems. So what's that being? Oh, so what's that? Being a world caregiver? That's what I think. Well, is she really a caregiver? Yes, without a doubt. Let's see, what does she do? As president of Polio Quebec, and she loves it and loves to be with people in her polio groups, and she likes to care for people. An experienced polio person that she is, she really helps us on all the Zooms all over the world. She stays busy by giving herself and of giving of herself, and she likes being a president. And to pass the time, she's strong interest in literacy. So she chairs two literacy programs as president. And as a hobby, she's a, she has a private group of learning disabled students and the most wonderful group of people you'll ever meet. All kinds of special abilities, people who she has taught for years. And we have all these people <laughs> who are on the spectrum. So it's really amazing and wonderful to be with these people. And she does games with these people. She takes them out to look for jobs. She just never stops. So here's a woman. Who, so here's a woman who gives a, a caregiver, a caregiver, a supreme caregiver. Well, that's enough for anyone, but not enough for her. So she sits on a hospital committee in her spare time and works with the Canadian government as a disabled person who sits on committees for solving wayfinding and housing solutions for the handicapped people across Canada. Yes, she's busy. It's amazing what polio does for her. So as I said, it's about opportunities and how I profit from her caring for the world is I do the dishes. I think that's fair. So as I was talking about opportunities, I do more than just the wash dishes. I cook and do all the things that go with the opportunity, buying food, making meals. And they do it well because if I take care of myself, I take care of her. It offers me a chance to be a caregiver. Of course, that's really nice to help out. Since this part is about me helping out, I had to learn how to cook. So I took courses, and my favorite course was working in a community kitchen and on average preparing four-course meals for women who are life experienced, all in their 60s and 70s. When we served these meals, we were celebrated with their applause. It, it amazed me. What these women have done was incredible. 
they as a group had made hundreds of thousands of meals. What magnificent human beings who gave and gave and never stopped giving. Our people just amazing. So I learned to appreciate women more and more and more. And how lucky I've been to have Mona in my life. Just so that I can be the best I can be. We've been together for 57 years and it's been just a wonderful life. Living with someone who cares about everyone in the world and just makes the world a better place by being who she is. So as her caregiver, I'm honored to be considered a caregiver. I really am surprised in my mind. I'm a person who does this because it's chivalrous. It's a chivalrous thing to do. Being a person who cares, I find it amazing that we share our lives together, loving each other. Mona and I, I mean. <clears throat> Mona and I, I mean. So it's a two-way street. She takes care of me, and I reciprocate by taking care of her. And P.S., she also does other things, like belonging to Rotary and gives positive speeches all over the world about polio. So we're just fine. So this is my way of saying thanks for all the opportunities to everyone. It was really wonderful meeting you couples online, and it was nice to meet other couples offline. It's really a wonderful thing to have these opportunities to care. Thank you very much. Mona, am I allowed to add a little story? A little quote, yes. Okay, something that Michael did to help another family. I am a retired early childhood administrator. And when a parent came to me many years ago when I was working, she wanted all the forms for the following year for her child. And I gave her the medical among the many forms. She said, I need to tell you that my sister does not want me to immunize my child for polio. And I looked at her, took a deep breath and said, I really can't discuss this with you. It's very personal. And I told her about Michael. I came home and when I told Michael, he was furious. He was yelling, but not at me, but yelling as if the mother was in front of him. And he said, I'm going to write her a letter. I said, please do not write it as a microbiologist because if something goes wrong, you are responsible. Write like a grandpa. And he wrote a grandpa letter and I gave it to her. She thanked me and two days later, she came to me and said, thank your husband very much. My daughter just got her first immunization of polio. And I said, well, did you tell your sister? She said, yes. I said, and what did she do? She was not happy, but I told her something that I'm not repeating on this program, but she said, I am very grateful and thank you. So it's, he really helped another family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Finally, the privilege of caring for an older friend or relative is one that comes with lessons. You'll get a peek into the patience and wisdom that comes with a life well lived. You'll have a perspective that keeps minor issues in their place as the more important life and death decisions come front and center. While being a caregiver is trying and not something everyone is cut out for, its rich rewards truly cannot be defined. Embrace your ability to adapt. Try to view change as a challenge and a chance to grow. Remind yourself that you're a strong person with a dynamic nature and that you'll be stronger as a result of this change. Also keep in mind that change can be a powerful motiv motivator to help you achieve your goals. To all, and especially to those couples here and everywhere who are working together Thanks so much. Love to you. May we give thanks to the both of us for all our years of bliss. We have what so few ever were able to find. I am so grateful for knowing you and your ability and to work together. I want to say thank you to all. I am going to plan another talk or workshop for those who don't have post who don't have caregivers. Thank you all. Ken, the last slide as we close.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.